Welcome to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Hi, Joe. Hi, Pam. Pam, every now and then, one of us in the law school takes center stage in a kind of a nationwide drama. You occupied that position a few weeks ago in your argument before the Supreme Court on the meaning of discrimination with respect to LGBT. We have a guest who's been taking center stage in a long-running drama for years and years now. Yes, and that's our colleague, John Donahue, who's the Wendell and Edith Carl Smith Professor of Law at the Law School. And John combines uh, two forms of expertise. He's a first-rate lawyer, and he's also a first-rate economist and empiricist. And that really accounts for how he's gotten into the areas of law that he's been most influential in. I mean, stretching back to his uh, studies of discrimination and lawsuits, going through one of the most notorious empirical studies ever done in the law, and culminating in the work he's doing now, which has to do with guns. And John, first of all, welcome back. Good to be here, Joe and Pam. We we interviewed you in one of our first Stanford Legals, but since then, so much has happened, some of it not very good in the area of gun violence and gun control. I want to start with a new study you've come out with that looked at what happened when for 10 years our nation actually had a ban on assault weapons. Yes. Um because uh, the uh, the courts around the country are, are engaging with this question of whether the assault weapon ban is a good idea to have and even constitutional, uh, I decided to do some empirical research on that question. And recently, uh, with a co-author from uh, Stanford, wrote, wrote a piece that uh, tried to assess what happened to mass shootings during the 10 years that we had a assault weapon ban in place at the federal level from 1994 to 2004. Could you explain what an assault weapon is? Yes. Well, the, the assault weapon ban had two components. One, it tried to um, limit the most dangerous long rifles, which are, were referred to as assault weapons. And these are, are weapons that are generally used more in battlefield settings, uh, usually would have uh, detachable magazines and would be high-powered weaponry. Uh, but another very critical part of the federal assault weapon ban was that it limited the size of the magazines that could be inserted into any gun that had the capacity to take a detachable magazine. Um, and of course, as we saw in, for example, the Las Vegas shooting where the guy was using very large uh, high-capacity magazines, he was able to shoot 400 people in a matter of minutes. So for 10 years in this country, uh, the nation prohibited uh, an, an array of assault weapons as well as uh, had a restriction on magazine size to no more than 10 bullets. And when we looked at the uh, number and death rate from the most serious gun massacres, those involving six or more deaths, we found there was essentially a noticeable drop in the number of such deaths uh, or, or number of such gun massacres uh, and a 40 percent drop in the total number of deaths from these gun massacres during the 10 years of the federal assault weapon ban. And that was because people presumably couldn't get off as many shots before they were stopped? I mean, what was the mechanism, do you yeah. think? Well, um, it's a great question. And, and of course, one thing that we're able to do now, um, looking back at the, the period since the assault weapon ban in, ended in, in 2004, is to see what has happened now that uh, the gun manufacturers are free to sell any sort of weaponry. And we've seen an enormous increase in these episodes of, of gun massacres and the use of both assault weapons and or high capacity magazines. And indeed, in the last five years where we've had more than five times the number of deaths that we experienced during the entire 10 year period of the federal assault weapon ban, every gun massacre of six or more deaths has either involved a, an assault weapon or a gun with a high capacity magazine or both. 
So it's a, it's an amazing and kind of shocking finding. This is a small part of total deaths from guns, but it's but it's still a big number. Yep. And these are people who could be with us if we didn't allow these weapons. What else could the weapons be used for? Give me, take me there. I want to buy one of these weapons. What's the name of what I'm buying, and how many bullets can I shoot in a minute? Yes. Well, so some of these weapons, uh, there was one used to shoot uh, five police officers in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, is advertised as being able to uh, uh, shoot 900 rounds in a minute. So, uh, you know, they, they can really get off a, a lot of firepower very, very rapidly. Um, and, um, you know, for example, one of the, the prominent guns that was used in the Sandy Hook massacre is the Bushmaster rifle, and it was advertised as consider your man card reissued, uh, which was a, a Bushmaster advertisement. And I think it it speaks to individuals who are sort of on the edge of mental illness, usually young adolescent males um, who may feel powerless and feckless in their lives. And the idea that if they can get their hands on one of these assault rifles, it will uh, empower them in a way. So, for example, the Parkland shooter in Florida uh, uh, wrote on his Instagram, uh, uh, now with the power of the AR-15, which he at 19 years old was able to buy in Florida, uh, you will you will know my uh, know who I am, and I'm tired of people uh, calling me an idiot uh, as he went out and then massacred 17 people at Parkland High School. So so these are, are weapons that uh, were initially uh, created for use in Vietnam because they were so potent and lethal, uh, but now they are becoming popular as, um, you know, weapons to have around the house for target shooting or uh, in some cases uh, some of these uh, militia groups like to have trainings in the uh, you know wilderness with their their assault weapons although they're not they're not really target shooting guns in the traditional sense I mean when I used to teach at the FBI Academy they took me out to the firing range once and I they had me use a Piss, uh, revolver because they were just switching over from revolvers to semi-automatic pistols and it was hard to shoot the revolver it had a bit of a kick then they gave me a semi-automatic pistol to shoot with and that you had a lot more control over and you really just touched the trigger and the gun would fire off and then they gave me a submachine gun to fire and you can't aim that thing really very much at all. And I said, well, you know, I don't have a lot of control over the aim. And the guy said, the point of this gun is just to spray point it in the general direction and spray things. So, you know, it's not a kind of hobby gun in that sense. Yeah, although the the typical AR-15 being sold today uh, is popular in part because they have made it lightweight so it can be maneuverable and, and also it cuts cuts down on the, the sort of kick involved. But you're, you're right. Uh, uh, usually most hunters would be embarrassed at the thought of using a, a weapon of that nature. Um, you know, typical hunters would be using a bolt action, single shot rifle. Um, and um, so it's not really a hunter's rifle and, and not the typical gun you would use, uh, you know, target shooting at a range, for example. Um, but people enjoy shooting it. Um, and, and of course, uh, now millions of them have been bought since the expiration of the federal assault weapon ban. This is Stanford Legal. And today we're talking with our colleague, John Donahue, about guns. And John, you mentioned that the federal uh, assault rifle ban has been lifted. A number of states have tried to deal with assault rifles. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there and what your role has been in helping helping states? Yes. Well, um, a limited number of states have uh, done either uh, uh, adopt an assault weapon ban similar to the federal assault weapon ban component or adopted a restriction on the size of the magazines or both. So California has adopted them both. And as a result, uh, 
the states that have adopted these have been sued uh, by the NRA or its affiliates to try to overturn these laws on Second Amendment grounds. And that's one big change from the period when we had the federal assault rifle ban, which really ended before the rise of the modern law of the Second Amendment. I don't know if you want to tell our uh, audience a little bit about how the Second Amendment and the interpretation of the Second Amendment changed right around the time that the assault rifle ban uh, sunsetted. Yes, that's that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, in 1939, which had been the major Supreme Court decision looking at the uh, Second Amendment, uh, the court said the obvious purpose of the Second Amendment was to guarantee the effectiveness and existence of a militia, uh, which is exactly what the amendment starts off talking about. Uh, but in 2008, so four years after the uh, lapsing of the federal assault weapon ban, uh, the Supreme Court, with a decision by Justice Scalia, said that uh, the first part of the Second Amendment was mere surplusage and could be ignored, and that you only look to the second part, which said um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And so all of the California, uh, the DC uh, restrictions on gun possession were struck down in the Heller decision in 2008. Right, that the Supreme Court said there's an individual right to bear arms rather than the right of the people to organize militias, which are kind of the 18th century equivalent of the National Guard today. That's right. Um, and so that means when uh, people go into court to challenge uh, a gun ban or the like, uh, the right to carry a weapon is treated as a kind of fundamental right. And some courts have said they'll only uphold gun bans under the most narrow circumstances. So do you want to talk a little bit about the California litigation? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I've been involved in a number of individual lawsuits in California. So first of all, challenges to the restrictions on carrying of guns as well as uh, the challenge to the assault weapon component of California law as well as the element involving the restrictions on high capacity magazines. And so far, we, we had um, successfully sustained those uh, provisions uh, with the exception of the restrictions on high capacity magazines, which in May, a federal judge here in California struck down as violative of the Second Amendment, that cit citizens have a federal constitutional right to have guns that have a high capacity magazine. And the expertise that you brought to these cases involved testimony saying what? That is what were you what were you brought in to tell the courts? Well, in different cases of course you're you're testifying about different aspects. So in the in the challenges to gun carrying, I had actually done a lot of work on what happens when states allow citizens to carry concealed weapons? And uh, I think the evidence is pretty clear that you do see an uptick in violent crime over the decade following adoption of right to carry laws. And so I would testify about that empirical evidence in those cases. And in the other cases about the assault weapons or the restrictions on high capacity magazines, I would turn to the latest study that I just spoke about earlier and show how those restrictions did seem to restrain uh, deaths from gun massacres in the United States. This is Stanford Legal, and we're talking with our colleague John Donahue about regulation of firearms. Joe? John, I want to focus a little bit on your role and just what it means to get these cases, because I know I'm sometimes a late night worker, and I sometimes see you have an office across the way from me. And I know when you've got one of these cases because I'm going home at 9 or 8 or 10, and you're really just in there for the, for the long haul, and you have this beaten down look. <laughs> How many of these cases have you worked on, and how long do they take? Uh, well, uh, good question. Right now, I'm involved with nine separate cases, although some of the cases uh, before that uh, have, have ended. So for the first one I think I worked on was the uh, uh, challenge to the Maryland assault weapon ban, but, but that case ended a while ago. Uh, but right now, there are nine active cases, and these are cases uh, for them in California, but other cases in Vermont, New Jersey, uh, just had a trial in Missouri. Um, so so there are a number of them going on. 
And of course, uh, everything depends on how much of a uh, uh, report is necessary for the case and, and how many rounds of depositions do you have to go through and do you have to travel uh, to testify. So, so you, you've got the same job we have as you teach at Stanford Law School. And of course, you do studies. You've got this other life, as it were, of dealing with depositions, testifying in court, and traveling all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a busy time. And the reason that I, I'm so active in it right now is um, if you look at the public opinion data, it really is an amazing moment in American history because the public is gradually but persistently moving in the direction of favoring greater restrictions on guns in the United States. And yet the Supreme Court is moving to a potential moment that will strike down every gun restriction in the United States on Second Amendment grounds. So it's a very pivotal moment. And if the Supreme Court renders a strong Second Amendment decision that wipes out, for example, assault weapon ban restrictions and restrictions on gun carrying, et cetera, um, that will define the law for potentially 30 or 40 years. And so it's it's a moment where I think the best evidence needs to be brought to the courts, and, and that's what I'm trying to do. I mean, one of the things that I found most striking in Justice Scalia's opinion for the court in the Heller case, which is really the beginning of this process, is... He says, um, you know, of course you can have some restrictions on guns. For example, you can't bring a weapon into a federal courthouse. And I thought that was a really striking example in important ways because, of course, when it comes to the justices themselves, they understand that it's a bad idea to have guns. And so when you compare the First Amendment, for example, to the to the Second Amendment, there are all sorts of rules that say, of course, you have the right to exercise First Amendment rights in the courthouse. There are, there's a famous case, Cohen against California, where a guy w was told he had the constitutional right to wear a jacket that said, fuck the draft in the courthouse. And yet they don't treat the gun right the same way when it comes to them. There's something very disconcerting about that. Yes. And, and indeed, um, there, there was... A lamentable dishonesty, I felt, in, in Scalia's approach in, in the Second Amendment case. First of all, he, he championed it as an originalist opinion. And I think most uh, honest commentators think he actually perverted the original intent of the Second Amendment. And there was also another feature that uh, Justice Stevens suggested was the result of uh, Justice Kennedy asking for some caveats put into the decision to show that it wasn't as expansive as uh, the NRA might have liked. But almost immediately, as soon as the ink dried on Heller, um, many of the justices, including Scalia and Thomas and Alito, sort of ignored those caveats, and they're hoping that they will not be sustained in the next opinion. We'll be back with more from our guest, John Donahue, talking about guns next on Stanford Legal here on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Hey, Joe. Hi, Pam. John, before the break, you were talking about the cases you've worked on at the state level. And... I want you to take us to kind of a loss and a victory. And you mentioned the loss on the high capacity magazines. Can what what did what did the court say there? Well, that's a very interesting episode. So essentially, the um, the people who were challenging the restrictions on high capacity magazines in the state of California filed two identical lawsuits in different federal district courts in California. And so we won one of those, but we lost one. And the one that we lost was a decision by Judge Roger Benitez in which he struck down every um, uh, restriction on the size of magazines in the state of California. Uh, so it was a, a particularly galling defeat in the sense that uh, even in the two cases that the, uh, the gun interests filed, we won one of them, but we did lose one of them. And of course, that became the definitive judgment because now you had a federal judge striking down the law. And and what was the rationale, or can you give us a, a flavor of the decision? 
Yeah, well, Judge Benitez has a very aggrandized view of uh, the need for guns and uh, the power of the Second Amendment. So, for example, uh, he stated, tyranny thrives best where government need not fear the wrath of an armed people. Uh, And I think that that idea is somewhat nonsensical. If you look around the the world, uh, the government in Yemen uh, certainly has to fear uh, the the armed citizenry, but uh, I don't think tyranny has been uh, eliminated by virtue of that. And, and that's, an, that's a very different rationale than even the two rationales that were in front of the Supreme Court in Heller. That is, in Heller, the question was... Uh, Is the right to bear arms the right of the militia, which is designed to protect us from external invasion, or is it the right of individuals to defend themselves in their homes? And the court talked about the interest people have in preventing robbers from breaking into their house or burglars or the like. And here, it's a very different rationale altogether. It's a kind of what's sometimes called the anti-insurrectionist rationale, which has no warrant whatsoever in the original understanding of what the Second Amendment was about. That's the idea that in order to keep the sort of black helicopters from landing on your roof, you have to have weapons. But if that's the notion of the kind of weapon that you have to have, then really people should be allowed to have nuclear weapons because that's how we prevent other governments from invading us. And, And nobody thinks that. Or does Judge Benitez think that? No, Judge Benitez thinks that, and Rand Paul, for example, thinks that that uh, the most powerful weaponry should be put into the hands of the citizens for exactly this reason. Uh, I I think that the judge is wildly misguided for the reasons you suggest. Uh, the The idea that uh, uh, we want to encourage American citizens to take up arms against the federal government is both unwise and also utterly feckless and insane. Because if the U.S. military decides to stand with the tyrannical federal government, uh, some armed citizens with uh, high-capacity magazines and assault weapons is not going to play an effective check on on the U.S. military. And I think we've we've seen the power of the U.S. military around the world, and it's, it's far beyond the capacity of any unregulated group of individuals to just express their own uh, annoyance or horror at, at, at a tyrannical government. What's it like, John, when you get a decision like this? Is it is it heartbreaking? How do you continue? How do you how do you deal with that? You know, it depends a little bit. Uh, the, the Judge Benitez decision was somewhat galling to me because it did uh, um, characterize a lot of so-called facts about gun violence in the United States that were so completely at odds with reality. And since I'm uh, someone who does a lot of empirical evaluation of law in this in this arena, that was that was galling. So, for example, uh, he cited uh, a study that claimed that between 340,000 and 400,000 lives were almost certainly saved by uh, private use of guns in, in the United States in the last year. And of course, um, there was a study that claimed that it's been so wildly refuted that it was unbelievable to me that a, a federal judge would cite that study. And of course, anyone who knew anything about homicide in the United States, where the highest number of individuals ever uh, uh, murdered in the United States in any year was 25,000, would know that there was nowhere near 400,000 lives saved by defensive gun use. So it was mistakes of that nature that proliferated throughout his opinion that were particularly galling. I do think that uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is most likely to overturn his decision, but then everything will ultimately reside with the U.S. Supreme Court, and and that, that remains to be seen what they will do. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking about legal regulation of firearms with our colleague John Donahue. John, John, John right before our mini break now, you mentioned the case coming up before the Supreme Court. It's a complicated case, and my understanding is it could get thrown out for mootness, meaning it isn't really relevant anymore, but it could be an occasion for the court to issue a broad pronouncement and just to amplify something you said earlier, if the court issues uh, what you might and I might consider uh, an extreme uh, 
uh, pronouncement there, we're pretty much stuck with it. That is, everything else in terms of gun control pretty much falls by the wayside. Yeah, that's absolutely right. If the Supreme Court does what a number of members of the court and, for example, Judge Roger Benitez of the uh, Federal District Court in California would like to see happen, it would be a very vigorous uh, pronouncement of, of the power of the Second Amendment to strike down gun restrictions across the nation. And since that would be a federal constitutional decision, it would essentially uh, eliminate the capacity of states to try to deal with problems like the public mass shooting problem that is growing and so uh, lamentably high right now in the United States um, for the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, so it, it, it's an interesting moment where citizen uh, approval of greater gun control measures is growing and yet we may have the Supreme Court slamming the door in the face of this uh, uh, public movement in the other direction. There's one area of regulation that a lot of people care a lot about and that seems to be getting a lot of press these days. And this is background checks, I guess in part because so many of the mass shootings seem to involve people where there really were red flags long before the shooting that there was something wrong. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, it's interesting you mentioned that because just today the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the Conference of, of Major Police Chiefs uh, wrote a very impassioned letter to the Senate saying that it is it is important for uh, the Congress to pass uh, uniform background checks, universal background checks, so that every gun sale in the United States would have to go through uh, a background check before a person could procure a weapon. And what kinds of people wouldn't be allowed to procure weapons under a background check? Well, in the United States, it tends to be a more limited uh, prohibition than we would see in many other countries. But at least for now, the main prohibitions are, are you a convicted felon? Uh, have you been declared in the language of the somewhat infelicitous federal statute, a mental defective, so someone with uh, some adjudicated uh, mental illness, um, and other people who have engaged in, in some sort of uh, domestic violence uh, could well be included as well. Well, gun violence continues to, to plague this country, and we're so fortunate at Stanford to have one of the world's experts on gun violence, a lawyer, an economist who's really playing a major role in trying to show what empirical science can show about violence and gun control, and is playing a role in so many cases across the country. John, we've had you on uh, in our first, uh, one of our first shows, and since then, it's been a lot more gun violence. I can't say the news has been great, but we hope to have you on again and to be discussing better news in the future. Thank you so much. And thanks to our listeners for joining us on Stanford Legal here on Sirius XM Insight 121.